I asked, are they some kind of entertainers? I was told, no, they were not entertainers, they're Hungarians. Oh yeah, now I gotta make a video on this. The Slavs! Oh boy, what have I gotten myself into now? Recently, the topic of the history of the Slavs, specifically of the Eastern variety, has been brought back into the limelight, thanks to a member of a Russian intelligence agency recounting grand tales of Yaroslav the Wise to a very confused member of an American intelligence agency on everyone's favorite website of Twitter.com. But of course, history is never simple, and people from all sides are trying to twist history into something it isn't. A simple narrative. As such, we all need to be on the same page regarding the events and truth of these countries' history. So to explain the long and widening history of the Eastern Slavs, we have to hop into some history. When we're not even at the start and there's already controversy, it's a real great sign. But regarding the first unified Eastern Slavic state, we have two different schools of thought, the Normanist and the Anti-Normanist stances. The agreed upon facts are such. The Scandinavian Vikings, known as Varangians, invaded the land of the Eastern Slavs. Then the Slavs pushed them back out. However, not having a unified government, things got a bit hectic. Here we go again. As such, well, here's the split. The Normanists argue that the Slavs invited back some of the Varangians, specifically three brothers from a tribe called the Rus, which may be the origin of the name of the Rus, who created the political framework of the Kievan Rus also bringing some cultural ideals from Scandinavia, which may or may not have blended with some of the Slavic cultures, to make a new Kievan culture. The anti-Normanist argument is that the Slavs already had organized the basic outline of a Kievan state, and simply invited some of the Varangians to become the kings, with no further cultural or political exchange. The argument is basically did the Varangian elite establish the Kievan Rus, or did the common Slavs? I don't know the answer. Do I look like a real historian to you? Don't answer that question. Either way, Ole, the first ruler of the Kievan Rus, sailed down to Kiev in 862 and became the ruler of Kiev, proclaiming that it shall become the mother of all Rus cities. Which he did by going and raiding the Byzantine Empire. Over the next few rulers, Kiev would expand and become a regional power, controlling from the Carpathian Mountains to the Volga. This leads to the most prominent outcome for any issues in Kiev. Break it apart into a billion pieces under control of different brothers, nephews, uncles, and other unclear familial connections. After a quick civil war, Volodymyr the Great came to the Kievan throne. His entire shtick was making Kiev more stable. He started consolidating power into his hands, putting his 12 legitimate children into different regional positions. This began a system where different branches of the royal family would each rule their own local section of the Kievan Rus, meanwhile fighting for who would also get to control Kiev and rule over the rest. The Kievan Rus' ethnic situation was... well, complicated. It was for sure a very metropolitan place, full of Finns, Estonians, Lithuanians, Poles, Jewish Khazars, regular Jews, Norse, Cuman, Yazigots, Pechenegs, Bulgars, and who knows what else. But of course, the Slavs also had their regional differences, fighting each other more than outside forces. But the extent of just how different they were is up to scholarly interpretation. However, a strong religion would help unify the state, and potentially it could also grant the Kievan Rus a valuable ally in the form of one of the major nations to the south that followed the big three religions. According to the Primary Chronicle, there were three major religions which Volodymyr had to choose between. Islam, Judaism, and Christianity. Reportedly, Volodymyr was turned away from Judaism because the Jewish god had allowed his people to take a fat L by losing their holy land, not once, but many times. Then, he didn't approve of Islam due to its taboo on drinking, which, as we know, is one of Eastern Europe's great joys. Then finally, Volodymyr accepted Orthodox Christianity due to the beauty of the Byzantine churches, and specifically the Hagia Sophia. However, in reality, it was really a decision between political allies. I mean, would you want the Khazars, the Caliphates, or the Roman Byzantines, Bulgarians, Hungarians, and Poles as allies? Although specifically, Volodymyr chose orthodoxy instead of Catholicism, due to concern of political autonomy, as the Catholic Church was transnational, and would certainly then get to influence the Rus. Meanwhile, the orthodox churches were Caesaropapist, and would act under the local ruler. Another concern was that Volodymyr wanted to marry a Byzantine princess, and the Byzantines would only accept if he was orthodox. As such, Volodymyr, motivated by the horny, hurried and Christianized the whole of his kingdom, literally ordering mass baptisms of the population in rivers all at once. After Volodymyr's death, there was another civil war between the brothers. Truly shocking. During this time, Kiev essentially began disintegrating from the inside, 
as different brothers and uncles and nephews and other vague relatives all took their parts of Kiev and ruled it while trying to avoid central authority. It was with the death of Vladimir Monomach that the central authority of Kiev then really collapsed. While continuing to exist in name, Kiev was in reality dead already, as many different fragmented states came to be from the collapse of its central authority. Meanwhile, Kiev became the center of some Fortnite-style battle royales, where the ruling family switched 47 times in a hundred years. However, from across the Eurasian steppe, the sound of cavalry could be heard across the ages, as the Mongol horde under the leadership of Genghis Khan would appear on the horizon. However, it was under Batu Khan, Temujin's grandson, that the Mongols would return and sack Kiev, eradicating what remained of the Kievan Rus. With the rifle stomp of the Kievan Rus, we see the fall of a unified East Slavic state. Somebody had to do it! Now, remember those principalities which were each fighting each other? Well, of those, we care about three. Polotsk, Novgorod, and Halifornia, which got its name changed to Ruthenia, for my sake, I think. These three principalities are the first states we can associate with uniquely Belarusian, Russian, and Ukrainian ethnicities. As the Mongols invaded, it either brought the territories it conquered under direct tributary status, or as a client state. The Mongols, after sacking Kiev, went and subjugated much of the former Rus lands, including Ruthenia and Novgorod. Meanwhile, however, Polotsk remained free from Mongol conquest. So good job, Belarus, you didn't get violently massacred by the Mongols. In the north, the state of Novgorod functioned as a merchant republic of sorts, in the same sphere as the German Hanseatic League. Novgorod was a wealthy state that followed a democratic system known as the Veche, which was formed by all free men in Novgorod and worked to oversee the decisions of the prince. The Veche even had the power to remove the prince, should he not have their best intentions in mind. But then, in the vast plains of Siberia, a small outpost conquered and ravaged by the Mongols began to take up arms. The city of Moscow. It was under Ivan I, the Moneybags, I kid you not, that's his title, where Moscow would find its footing. Allying with the Mongols, Ivan built up a massive amount of wealth, which he used to debt trap his neighbors and annex their lands, increasing Moscow's power. The massive wealth that Moscow accrued led to the Patriarch of Vladimir, formerly the Patriarch of Kiev, to move instead to Moscow. Remember from earlier, Orthodox churches were under the rulers, so moving to the center of Eastern strength was a no-brainer. Following this, the Moscovites would begin rebelling against the Mongols, using this chance to subjugate more neighboring Rus principalities. All this led to multiple wars against their favorite merchant republic to the north, which ended in 1478, where following the Battle of Shalon, Moscovy annexed Novgorod. Meanwhile in the west, we have Polotsk and Ruthenia, sliding back the time or two before the official end of the Kievan Rus, but after the effective end of any real united Rus state. The two states of Galicia and Ruthenia would be united under Roman Mstislavich, a noble from Ruthenia. Then, in 1203, he would go on to take control of Kiev, with his realm looking something like this. Now, it's not perfect, I know, but it's pretty damn close. With his maneuvering, Roman had managed to unite most of modern-day Ukraine, having the principalities of Kiev, Pereslav, Galicia, and Volhynia under his control. Then, with his son Danilo, we see the beginning of an interesting trend in Ukrainian history, which is unusually warm relations with not having their church be the same as the Muscovite one, as Danilo negotiated with the Vatican to become Catholic in exchange for an Eastern Crusade against the Mongols. But this didn't work out. However, then, when the Patriarch of Kiev moved to Vladimir and then to Moscow, the galician ruthenian ruler, Yuri, would go on to obtain Constantinople's approval to create a separate metropolitanate in Halich. A unique church separate from Moscow, hmm? However, after a few more rulers, the native ruling dynasty would come to an end. And even with the Polish Bloslau keeping the principalities afloat a little while longer, they would fall to Poland and Lithuania soon enough. Speaking of Poland and Lithuania, it's time to talk about Polotsk. Polotsk was one of the first Slavic principalities in the Kievan Rus to escape Kiev's sphere. Although even before it did, it managed to hold a unique place of power in the west of the Kievan Rus. Polotsk's most famous ruler was Veseslav, the mother flippin' sorcerer! Yes, that's his title, I will not elaborate. Veseslav is also said to have been a werewolf, transforming at night to race along the moonlit snowy fields. Also, supposedly his dad was a magic serpent. This guy's wild, huh? Anyway, due to the fact that his father had never ruled Kiev, probably on account of him being a snake, eh, he was excluded from Kiev's succession. In response, he led his troops to instead pillage Novgorod, burning it to the ground and stealing the bell and some other religious items from the Cathedral of Holy Wisdom, which he would use to create his own Cathedral of Holy Wisdom, which still stands today in Belarus, 
Vizislav also became the ruler of Kiev for a bit, when he was freed from prison during a revolt in Kiev. So, that also happened, I guess. How the hell hasn't this guy been made into a fake character yet? Lazongo! Get on that! Regardless, after the Mongols ended the Kiev Rus for good, Polotsk actually managed to remain almost completely untouched by the Mongol raids, and never had to pay tribute to the Mongols. However, it would come under the sphere of the then rising Lithuania, becoming annexed in 1307. Back to Russia, we arrive at Muscovy's most infamous ruler, Ivan IV, otherwise known as Ivan the Terrible. Not a great translation, but it sounds epic as heck. Also, fun fact, Ivan is a member of the Rurukian dynasty. Remember that guy that established the Kievan Rus? Yeah, that family's still here. Crazy, huh? Anyway, Ivan is also known as the first Tsar of the Tsardom of Muscovy, which means Emperor and Empire. The coronation of Ivan IV as the Tsar also officially changed Muscovy's name to Russia, now officially the Tsardom of Russia. This change of name was more than just aesthetic, as Russia's adaption of the term of the Land of the Rus meant that they were claiming sole inheritance of the Kievan Rus, which was the original unified Land of the Rus. Essentially, this meant that the Russians were claiming to be the sole inheritors of the Kievan Rus, and that all the Rus were Russian. Now then, the other Eastern Slavs don't quite agree, saying that although they are Rus, they are not Russians. This was shown as they continued to be called Ruthenians, while referring to the Russians as Muscovites, or Moscovites, today. Wait, why'd I get beeped? Anyway, following Ivan, the subsequent Russian rulers expanded Russian control massively, especially to the east, as the Russians employed the Cossacks to lead expeditions to colonize the vast plains of Siberia. Speaking of the Cossacks, leaving behind proto-Stalin and his Oprichniki secret police, we go back to Ukraine. In the 1400s, the land which now makes up Ukraine began to be known as the Wild Fields, as serving as the boundary of empires, Russian, Polish, Lithuanian, and Tartar, meant that control over these areas was often weak, if present at all, meaning that many people that sought freedom from oppressive governments would flee here. It was in these wild fields that the Zaporizhian Cossacks would flourish, as this region became known as the borderlands of the empires, which is where the word Ukraine comes from. Now then, something that's often misunderstood is that Cossack isn't an ethnicity. Shoo Hitler, shoo! No, it's basically a job description. As such, any ethnicity can be a Cossack. But the Zaporizhian Cossacks of the Pontic Steppe were a group that was by and large Ukrainian, sometimes called the Red Rus. But not exclusively, and would serve as some of the most important players in the cultural development of Ukraine. The Zaporizhian Cossacks were famously fiercely independent, as they would shift their alliances the moment that any side attempted to exert too much influence on them, shifting between Polish, Russian, and Ottoman, and sometimes Swedish allies. The Zaporizhians managed to create the independent Cossack Hetmanate, a quasi-democratic people's militia. Anarchists eat your heart out. Well, I mean... The best story from the Zaporizhians at this time is easily the reply of the Zaporizhian Cossacks. As the story goes, the Ottomans had attempted to subjugate the Zaporizhians, however were badly defeated by the Cossack strategies. Not wanting to take defeat well, Sultan Mehmed IV sent the Zaporizhians an ultimatum, demanding the Zaporizhians kneel to Ottoman control. In response, under the leadership of Ivan Sirko, the Zaporizhians wrote a letter to the Sultan, describing in great detail how he could take his threats and shove it. <laughs> God, I love history. Unfortunately, while history can be immensely entertaining, it can also be cruel, as in 1667, the Russians and the Poles decided that fighting each other was getting tiring. So they signed the Treaty of Andrusovo, and just cut Ukraine in half. Wait, why do I feel foreshadowing? But it's not that bad, because both sides of the Hetmanate received some semblance of autonomy within Poland and Russia. Until it didn't anymore, in Poland in 1699, and in Russia in 1783. Back to Belarus as... well... Belarus won't get another independent state for a few hundred years. However, in exchange, they get to be extremely important to Lithuanian history. The Lithuanian language, while spoken across Lithuania, did not have a written form. As such, documents were often written in Ruthenian, which is early Belarusian and Ukrainian. Although in this case, more Belarusian, as the northern dialects of Ruthenian had already began to display unique attributes as far back as the 13th century. Some examples of documents written in Ruthenian would be the Statutes of Lithuania, which outlined the laws and legislations of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania and the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth. Good job, Belarus, being the lawyer of the Eastern Slavs. But these wouldn't be the only important documents written in Old Belarusian, as in 1517, Francis Skarinia, an ethnic Belarusian, would be the first person to translate the Bible into Old Belarusian, being the first Eastern Slav to translate the Bible into their native language, beating out the Russians and Ukrainians who were still using the Old Church Slavonic. 
The Belarusians were seen as unique from the Poles and Lithuanians, being referred to as either Ruthenians or Litvins, depending on whether they were in the east or west of the Commonwealth. But they would also follow Orthodoxy as opposed to Catholicism. Although this would change with Polonization, as a majority of Belarusians actually switched their religion over to Catholicism. As with the Union of Brest, the Ruthenian Orthodox Church pledged loyalty to Rome, and became a Byzantine Catholic Church. Note that this also happened to the Ukrainians, as they also joined the Union Church and became Byzantine Catholics. Fun fact, that's my religion! Another noticeable effect of Polonization is the linguistic impact of Polish on Belarusian and Ukrainian, which makes these modern languages actually closer to Polish than Russian. Fun fact, Ukrainian is actually less similar to Russian than Romanian is to Spanish. This episode is full of fun facts, huh? Back to Russia, we come to the most important rulers of Russia, that being Peter the Great and Catherine the Great. Peter would do a lot for making Russia more Western-styled and powerful, including BTFOing Sweden from great power status, eyeing up the Turkish control over the Black Sea, and creating Russia's new imperial capital, St. Petersburg. Which wasn't actually named after him, yeah, I was surprised too, but actually named after the Apostle St. Peter. But then, with Catherine the Great, we have more to talk about. Catherine was the instigator behind the partitions of Poland, as Russia, Prussia, and Austria would each decide to split Poland into thirds, and take a part for themselves. Weird. I swear this has happened before. And again? This now meant that the three Rus societies were all under the same empire. The Russian Empire. But things wouldn't be all flowers and rainbows. The old labels Muscovite, Litvin, and Ruthenian were cracked down against, as the Russians labeled themselves the Great Russians. Meanwhile, the Ukrainians and Belarusians would begin to be referred to as Little Russians and White Russians. This combined with Russianization and the settling of ethnic Russians into southern Ukraine, and especially the new territories of Crimea to replace ethnic Ukrainians and Mongolian Tatars, would work to force a Russian ethnic identity onto the other local groups. The Russians outlawed the Little Russian dialect in Ukraine, and mandated the use of Polish or Russian in Belarus, which was followed in 1840 by Tsar Nicholas I banning the word Belarus, and instead demanding that all Belarusians be referred to as Russians, and the region as the Northwest Territory. A neat tidbit is that in the 1880s, the Russians wanted to try colonizing some land they got in the far east from China, that being the modern area of Vladivostok, so they offered free land to a bunch of Ukrainians in the east. As such, this region became known as the Green Ukraine. Neat! Before we get to the 20th century, let's take a look at this ethnic census of Russia from 1897. Note how actually massive Ukraine is, which, when we also combine it with the Austro-Hungarian ethnic census from 1910, we can see just how massive the Ukrainian presence in Eastern Europe was. Also, note Green Ukraine. Belarusians would also be more widespread than today. I've also been told that it's crucial that I mention that Vilnius is ethnically Belarusian in this map. I don't know why. But keep this map in mind when I show you the regions the USSR outlined for their ethnicities. While in Russia, the Ukrainian language was suppressed. In Austria, the language was allowed to be used for literature, which made Austria the core of Ukrainian ethnic consciousness. This wasn't to undermine Russia, but to instead undermine Polish nationalism, which was becoming a problem in Austrian Galicia. Regardless of the reason, this nationalism came in handy when, surprise, World War I. Following Russia getting beaten by Japan in the Russo-Japanese War, and then the Central Powers in the Great War, a bunch of different ethnic groups in Russia decided that maybe this empire isn't for us. Both Belarus and Ukraine, along with a bunch of other groups, tried to split off from Russia, with the Ukrainian Black Army gaining large fame as being one of the only two effective anarchist societies in history. So that's cool. Unfortunately, most of these independence movements were quashed by the Reds and incorporated into the Soviet Union, where they created unique SSRs for the different ethnicities in the New Republic. A bright side was that a new Ukrainian autocephalous Orthodox Church was created separate from the Moscow one, but a certain mustachioed menace would ensure that that wouldn't last. April 3rd, 1922. We see the rise of Joseph Stalin to the leadership of the Soviet Union, and this would be a catastrophic moment for Ukraine. Stalin would enact the Holodomor, a targeted famine that sought to greatly damage the Ukrainian ethnic identity. The famine was not isolated to Ukraine, but also parts of Kazakhstan, the Kuban, and other parts of the Soviet Union. But the Soviets introduced passports and kept the starving populations of Ukrainians from leaving their designated territories, with large amounts of Ukrainians in Kazakhstan and the Kuban also perishing, while other ethnic groups seemed to fare a lot better during starvation. At the same time, the Soviets executed planned cullings of Ukrainian intellectuals and clergymen, ending the unique Ukrainian church. In general, this was a horrific time to be Ukrainian, as estimates range between 4 million and 8 million people died as a result of the Holodomor. And just when it seems it can't get any worse, one mustache man would ally with the other and start the Second World War, 
The molotov ribbentrop Pact between the Soviet Union and the Third Reich would outline the third time that Ukraine and Poland get partitioned in this video. Ah, finally, that foreshadowing paid off. This partition would add more land to the Belarusian and Ukrainian SSRs, followed by the Soviet annexation of Basarabia and North Bukovina from Romania, which added the territories of South Basarabia and North Bukovina to the Ukrainian SSR. In 1954, the new head of state in the Soviet Union, Nikita Khrushchev, transferred the Crimean Peninsula to Ukraine. This was approved by both the Russian SSR and the Ukrainian SSR. Then, in 1991, the Soviet Union collapsed, and the SSRs each proclaimed independence. First Ukraine, then Belarus, then Russia. Ironically enough, Russia wasn't the last to leave the SSR. That would be Kazakhstan, who was a week late to the leaving party. Man, imagine if Kazakhstan had just stayed the Soviet Union. The UN would be way more fun today. Notably, Ukraine managed to get over 50% approval to become an independent nation-state in all of its provinces. Even Crimea! Regardless, the post-Soviet years have been a bit of a wild ride, with Russia getting itself into a chaotic spell with the Chechens, Ukraine having multiple revolutions, and Belarus... honestly just chilling. In 2014, the Russians invaded Crimea and began a proxy war in the Donbass with the goal of destabilizing Ukraine from joining the EU and NATO. Meanwhile, Belarus was busy ping-ponging between the EU and Russia, then in 2019, the Ecumenical Patriarch of Constantinople recognized the Ukrainian Orthodox Church as being autocephalous, making it independent from Moscow, again, for like, the fourth time. Unfortunately, Moscow did not agree and declared split seeds with Constantinople. Huh, why did I hear this one before? Since then, in 2022, Russia invaded Ukraine full-on, starting or escalating the Russo-Ukrainian War, depending on who you ask. But seeing as that's still ongoing, I will leave it at that. Regardless, that brings us to today, and is the entire history of the Eastern Slavs. Truly, something that is free of all controversy, where everyone will get along. Man, at this rate I should do a history of the Holy Land next. Or maybe just talk about Romania and Dacia again. Either way, I'll start a war. Yo, host and inspector here. Huge thanks to my Ukrainian, Belarusian, and Russian friends for helping me research and edit this script. I couldn't have done it without them. This video took way more researching than any of my other videos, so it took a lot longer to finish. Maybe next video won't be so researched. But either way, always remember.